Uh, Jenna, uh, tell us a little bit about uh, career civility and why you think good communication is such an important component of uh, workplace culture. Absolutely. Thank you, Kurt. And I'm really glad to be here today as well. So thank you for having me and giving us this opportunity to have this conversation and creating this space as well. Um, myself at Career Civility, I always say that I'm on a mission to redefine communication in the workplace. Um, everyone knows that communication is the number one skill that we need, you know, whether it's the soft skill that employers are looking for or whether it's how you, um, you know, stay sane with your partner in quarantine <laughs> um, in the same apartment. And yet no one really knows what it looks like. Um, so I took this issue and this problem and I've been studying civil communication, uh, which is the act of communicating productively and it's a means to uh, exemplify good communication and implementing that into the workplace. So, you know, it could be one on one with a team member, with a manager or a people leader, but it can also be within a team environment as well. Because a lot of times we come up to those roadblocks and we just don't know how to effectively get around them with communication. And Jackie, you have the uh distinction of creating the diversity beyond the checkbox course al along with the team and being the head writer. And one of the topics that you covered in the course is inclusive language. Could you define what that is and, and why, why is it so important for us to understand what that is? Absolutely. Um, I'm really glad to be here. Um, inclusive language, Kurt, it means consciously working to find ways to name, honor, and value uh, experiences and identities that are often minimized. Um, we have to really begin to uncover our own unconscious assumptions about what's normal. And inclusive language prevents missteps with every contact you can think of from employees to suppliers to customers. And leaders should want to create workplace cultures of inclusiveness that encourage employees to be their authentic selves because then they are more productive and you have a better culture overall. Right, so seeking to understand uh, who you're speaking to is important. And so on the face of it, you could think of inclusive language or civil communication as the same thing as being politically correct. Mm -hmm. And so could you talk a little bit, starting with you, Jackie, why um, political correctness and inclusive language aren't the same thing uh, with that particular point of view? Yeah. So from my perspective, political correctness has to do with not offending. It's very prescriptive. Inclusive language is more about learning and understanding and leaning into the humanity of communication. So that's the, the difference that I see. And Jenna, what, what do you think about that as uh, a challenge that people might think about as they think about not offending, but wanting to make sure they're not saying the wrong thing? Absolutely. And I think that's a really important question as well, because along the same lines of political correctness, I also hear people thinking that, you know, civility is also in line with being polite. And a lot of times when you're polite or politically correct, you don't engage in the conversation because you're like, well, I'm just going to say something incorrect. So I, w I just won't even say anything at all. Um, and I think that perpetuates, you know, silence as you see the sign, silence is violence, you know, that perpetuates the wrongdoings in, in the workplace. Um, and I would challenge that civil communication specifically um, is the ability to engage in those tough conversations. And like Jackie said, you know, if you're bringing humanity back into the workplace and back into the conversation, you know, one of my main principles or guidelines is remember there's a human on the other end of that conversation. Because if you're able to remember that, you don't have to worry about being politically correct or being polite because you're thinking of them as equal. You know, I am a human, they're a human. We can engage in this tough conversation. Why do you think humanity gets left out of the workplace? Because a lot of times when we think about a workplace environment, it's about performance. It's about making sure that we're hitting numbers. It's we're winning. And humanity doesn't seem like it's an important piece of that. Why do you think that's those two things go together because a lot of people would argue that they don't. Well, from my perspective, Kurt, you know, people are the ones that are doing the work and people bring themselves to work and whether they feel accepted or not accepted, it's not just about the measurement towards goals. It's about who's doing the work, who's, 
you know, engaged in what's happening and talking to your customers, you know, what kind of work is being done? Is it inspired work? Do people feel comfortable being creative and, and sharing their, you know, thoughts on innovation? So I think people try to disconnect it as to not offend, but really um, being inclusive is about allowing people to be their full selves as they come into the workplace because, you know, people bring their experiences and their, their hurt and their frustrations and their happiness and exhaustion and whatever else they might be feeling into the workplace with them. And it's important to embrace all of that uh, with the, the culture that you want to build in an organization. Yeah, and I think it's easier to disconnect the work from the human. You know, we even use it in our, in our own language, their resources. You know, how many requirements do you have open? You know, what are your, um, what, what's the job description? Um, we disconnect the human from the work that's being done in the workplace. And I always say, you know, you learn at a very early age um, when you're going to school, you kind of check your personality at the door. Um, when you step into the workplace, it's the same thing. When you clock in, you put on the corporate cloak. When you clock out, you can put your hat back on. Um, so I do think there's a disconnect. I think it's easier that way because it's just business. Um, and we don't have the tools or we don't have the understanding to incorporate the two. Right. So that, that's a good segue into, I think, some of the tenets of civil communications from your, uh, some of the work that you do, Jenna. And so could you talk about being able to connect those two things that seem like they're different, where you've got the workplace and you've got humanity? How does civil communications connect those two ideas? Yeah, that's a great question. And it's hard. It's definitely not easy because, like I said, a lot of times when you're in the workplace, you know that you're not performing, like, you know, you're not hitting your goals or your targets, or, you know, if you're working on a project, you're not hitting those sprints, but you can't understand why, you know, is someone not, is someone slacking, you know, are we not able to communicate directly? Like, what is the issue? And I think that that's a very common problem in civil communication is the way to remedy that. So when, for example, um, if you're in a team and you're not delivering on the requirements, have you ever sat down to sit with the team and ask them, Hey, what's going on in your personal life? Or, Hey, you know, what are you struggling with? It's usually someone sending an email being like, you were supposed to deliver this on Friday. I expect this on my desk by the end of the day. Okay. You know, if we want to play tough love, fine, but eventually we're going to have to get to the root of the problem. And by being able to sit down at a desk or at a table altogether as a team um, or even one-on-one -on -one and really uncovering you know, I'm, I'm here for you, I am in your corner, and I expect a lot from you, so how can I help you deliver, you know, or how can I step into your corner and pick up where we need to pick up? I think the pandemic is a great example of that because people are going home to illnesses, they're going home to, you know, large events being canceled in their life. There's a lot of outside stress going on that while they step into work, hey, you know, I'm feeling okay. I got through my to-do list today and yet something isn't clicking. So how can you sit down with them and uncover that um, behind the scenes? And that's how civil communication can help remedy some of those issues. Got it. And, and so as we think about how to begin to bring these things together, language is really important. You know, words definitely matter. And Jackie, as we think about how to be inclusive uh, in our discussion, so it's one thing to understand that if someone's struggling, but how do you how do you have a discussion with them using the right language so that they're going to respond in the right way and, and help to be part of the, the discussion? And, and as we're having that discussion, our intent is, is met with the right kind of response. Yeah. So, Kurt, I would say, you know, understanding the rules for inclusive language is very important and I'll, I'll share those with you. There are six, so I'll run through them um, quickly. Uh, but the first is to put people first. Um, you know, always lead with the person, not with characteristics. Um, for example, instead of saying a blind man, you would say a man who is blind. And then only mention characteristics like gender, uh, sexual orientation, 
religion, racial group, or ability when it's relevant to the discussion. Um, very rarely do you ever hear someone say, my male doctor or my cis hetero friend, right? But um, by the same token, you know, there's not a reason to say my woman doctor if that's not relevant to the conversation. Um, the next is use universal phrases. So industry jargon and acronyms can make people feel excluded and you don't want that. Um, also many, many uh, idioms don't translate well from country to country. So you need to know who your audience is. So if you're saying, you know, touchdown instead of, you know, you hit that on the mark, you know, sometimes people won't understand that. So you have to be careful of, of how you're phrasing things. Um, the third is recognizing the impact of mental health language. So very often, you know, we hear people say, oh, you know, I'm OCD, um, but those are real mental health diagnoses. So don't use those terms to describe everyday behavior, you know, say, you know, um, attention to details high or whatever, but don't use mental health language to describe everyday behaviors. Um, the next is to use um, gender neutral language. So using guys to address all people in a room is gendered and in can insinuate that men are the preferred gender at an organization. So instead you wanna use words like everyone or team or you all. And as a Northeasterner, I admit that that's my Achilles heel. Um, so I try not to use guys in, in what, uh, my conversations. Uh, the fifth one is be thoughtful about the imagery you use. So when you hear things like, having a black heart and things like that, that can be offensive. You wanna use different language. So like in old cowboy movies, you know, the villain wore a black hat and the hero wore a white hat. You know, don't use those types of images in the language that you're um, using or writing. Um, and then the final thing is just ask if you aren't sure. Inclusive language is evolving like we are as a society. Um, so, you know, for example, you take time to find out how a person self-identifies rather than making assumptions, um, and that makes them feel properly acknowledged and respected. So you can ask about someone's pronouns. But if you think about those six things as you um, talk to people, and it it takes time. You know, diversity, inclusion, equity are all a journey that that we're on, and and you know, there's no end to that journey. It's always evolving, always growing. And hopefully we are too, um, you know, constantly learning. But if you think about those th six things as you um, have your conversations with, with people, um, it's a, a way to make them feel um, seen and appreciated. So then do you have anything you would, would add to that uh, from sort of your uh, career civility okay. hat? Yeah, I think that was great. And I think that was very, you know, those tips are very tactical as well, because it's, you know, that's breaking down the barriers of, I don't even want to approach this conversation, but if I can remember there's a person on the other side of that, um, it helps, it, you know, you can take one step closer to having a conversation over a political disagreement or over a different idea in the workplace. I think a lot of times with civil communication, I'm working on de-escalation tactics as well. So instead of saying, you know, you didn't do this, or you made me feel like this, I always use the tagline in my experience or how I experienced this situation. Um, it's very, you know, very therapy esque to say I feel and sometimes in the workplace, that's just not as, you know, business professional. So then you can flip it on its head and say, this is how I experienced the situation. Um, you can say, you can challenge it by saying, you know, if Jackie, when you, um, I think it was number six with ask them, mm -hmm. um, that's okay too. You know, in your experience, how did that, how did that help or how did that harm the situation? Can you help me understand a little bit more? Um, you can always ask if you don't know either. And I think a lot of people are afraid to ask because they're afraid to show their, you know, I don't want to say ignorance, but what they don't know. A lot of times in the workplace, you have to know everything and there's a pressure to know everything, but you can ask. <laughs> That's the only other thing I would add. Got it. And so there, there may be some folks that listen to the six rules and say, oh my gosh, that's, that's so much to remember. 
I, I don't know how I'm going to be able to engage in that kind of dialogue. And I'm just going to, you know, revert back to what I know. And so what's the danger in reverting back to what you know, uh, Jackie, as you think about the risk of, of not trying to have an inclusive dialogue with somebody? Yeah, so uh, it's a lot, Kurt. So you lose in recruiting, you know, from the job description through the interview, you can lose top candidates that can help you move your business forward. With retention, you know, if you're offending your high performing employees, you know, what do you think is going to happen? You're going to lose those folks. And we can literally spend the rest of this webinar talking about the cost of turnover, but it's more aggressive than a lot of people realize. Um, are you in sales? The decision makers are changing. Um, there's more diversity at that level. So if you're offending someone, you know, how much do you think they're going to buy from you? Um, in marketing, you're limiting your market reach by not being able to appeal to broader audiences. Um, women control the majority of discretionary spend for their households. And then culturally diverse buying power is on the rise, especially among Asian and Latinx communities. And then, you know, one of my favorite things is, you know, here comes Gen Z and they're more diverse than any generation before. And they prioritize diversity because there's more diversity in their homes, among their friends. And they're also cause-based buyers, not brand-based. So the brand that they like has to align with causes that resonate with them. So if you're not ready for them in the workplace and in your consumer strategy, um, you know, you're going to have a problem. That's, that's exactly right. And so there's, there's a risk to not saying anything or continuing to uh, foster the status quo. And um, as you're dialoguing with folks, Jenna, in your work, how do you, how do you open a conversation with someone where you're observing what's happening and you recognize that they're not being inclusive? Um, what are some of the strategies that you use to get folks to come to the awareness that they need to do something different and how do you coach them through that process? Yeah, I think it almost starts before the incident ever happens um, or the occasion ever happens. So if I'm working with, you know, an organization, I'm asking them, you know, do, your, do you have a safe environment? Do your employees feel psychologically safe to be able to stand up to this microaggression or this aggression? Um, that is something that is hard for a lot of people because the, you know, the reflex answer is yes. And then, you know, I'll challenge them. Okay. You know, can we continue to observe this? Um, because I do think it starts before the incident ever happens. Um, if you are in a psychologically safe environment, I think there's a couple ways that you can maneuver it depending on your personality, depending on the situation. A lot of times I advise, uh, to let things cool down. You know, it's kind of like when you type out an email and you want to hit send and you're like, okay, maybe I'll wait until after lunch and see if I still feel the same way. Um, I also apply that same logic um, when addressing an incident. So if you have a weekly one-on-one -on -one with your manager, you know, putting that on the docket to discuss then. A lot of times the emotion is taken out of it. Um, but there are also incidents where you have to address it right in the moment because otherwise people won't learn in that situation. And again, if you're saying, hey, I just experienced some hostility when I, you know, gave this new idea, can you help me understand where that came from or why this is happening? Um, again, in my experience, can you help me understand or can I learn more? Um, those are some tactics that I will help people with. I always try to give people quotations because it seems, you know, uh, easier to implement. It seems weird at first, but once you're in the actual conversation, it flows a lot better than you think it does. Kurt, so, I don't know if I'm su supposed to be taking notes uh, as a panelist, but I, <laughs> <laughs> I am writing down some notes from Jenna's yeah. statement. So thanks, Jenna. Yeah, and I saw one of the, the questions was, you know, can you send the six inclusive languages after? So I was like, I'll just pocket that. Yeah, <laughs> keep that for later. And that that's the I think the the power of uh, the work that we do is that we're always learning something new uh, as we're we're talking to folks and there there's no end to this and so because we're learning something new there's there's uh, times where we make mistakes mm -hmm. and uh, 
could you both talk about as as your practitioners in the space where you've blown it or you've made a mistake and how you from it as you're trying to have a dialogue with someone yeah so generally i'm i'm pretty good you know i i do teach this stuff after all but um the language is ever evolving and you have to be a constant student as you said kurt um, guys is the one that gets me every time. I've been saying it for more than four decades and, um, you know, it's a Northeastern thing and I, I try to work through it. And even just a quick story, um, a colleague of mine, uh, and myself and, and another were working through the, the course around inclusive language and, um, this particular video and getting the language right. And, you know, on the phone as I'm getting off, you know, thanks guys. And then I have to stop the whole, you know, before we hang up and, and correct myself in the moment. And it's, it's tough, you know, it's a constant journey. Um, but the most important thing is that you do correct yourself in the moment and be vulnerable and let people know that while it's okay to stumble, it's not okay not to know that there's a different way to say it. And so it's important that even though, you know, we have these, these stumbling blocks or, or these things that trip us up, um, that we correct ourselves um, because it's important to show that we're willing to, you know, be vulnerable in the moment. I'll actually get a little vulnerable off that question. Um, I always joke, you know, a communications consultant um, and then she doesn't know how to communicate. I always find that my downfall or some mistakes that I make is I'm actually too quiet when I need to stand up and use my voice, um, especially personally. Uh, just a little background about myself. So I'm a quarter African American and I'm three quarters white. Don't really know what else is in there. Uh, my dad was adopted. So I'd have to do 23 and me to really give you, you know, the whole rundown. Um, but I, you know, you get jokes poked at you um, and people, you know, making the Oreo jokes and, you know, asking you, you know, just inappropriate um, questions and jokes. And I always laughed it off. And I was always quiet about it. And I never really stood up and made a point. And if I can't do that for myself, I'm probably not gonna be able to do that for someone else. So I think if it is, you know, if I'm an outsider looking into a situation, I can, you know, consult on best practices of how to handle that situation. But when it comes to my own, I stumble. Um, so that's been something that I've been actively working on and politely calling in people, if you will, when they do make those comments or jokes and that's uh i think a good segue uh to another thread i wanted to tie uh as as we look at both of your backgrounds so it, it turns out that um both of you uh ha are bi biracial mm -hmm. uh, and as we think about identity and rules, it's interesting because this is very different than the first part of the discussion. So we were talking about rules for inclusive language, but then the temptation is to create rules for categorizing people. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's not that simple. Uh, people are complicated, we're complex. And as we think about our characteristics, we're multidimensional. So both of you happen to be multidimensional because it would be easy to say, both Jackie and Jenna are biracial, so they have the same experience. But that's also not the case because you come from different generations, different areas of the country. And so there's, there's lots of multidimensionality uh, as we think about both of you. And so what I wanted you to both talk a little bit about is the question of identity and belonging mm. and the challenges that you faced with that. Because if you were to neatly categorize your backgrounds, and you filled out a form, it's hard to do that. And so what impact has that had on you as you've entered into the different organizations and inter inter interacted with different people? Uh, so we can talk about that one a little bit because I, I think that's an important thing to raise in terms of just the diversity between the two of you, um, while on the face of it may seem that there's not much diversity. Who wants to go first? Jackie, you want to go? Yeah, I'll 
I'll take it. Um, so I was born in 1974, which was seven years after the Loving versus Virginia ruling that um, banned the illegality of interracial marriage. So my father was white, my mother is black, and um, I grew up in a multiracial, multi-generational household. My grandparents lived with us once they retired. They were from the South, my parents are from the North. Um, you know, blue collar, white collar. So I had lots of experiences and perspectives under one roof. And I got to see bias occur real time. And I got to hear, you know, unfiltered perspectives real time. And, you know, um, I, my skin is light, but I, you know, get my features inherently, you know, from my mom. So I get questions about ethnicity, but there's a general assumption that I'm black. But having a white father in the 1970s was different. And I got asked a lot if that was my real dad. And, um, you know, I struggled with where I fit in in the world until high school. Um, and in high school, I was confronted head on by a now very dear friend, but then misguided friend um, who's, you know, discussed his parents' views on interracial marriage. And um, that's when I decided to lean all the way in on who I was and honor my full heritage. Um, but I'm a black woman and I'm proud of what that means from a journey perspective. And I try to use uh, my privilege as much as possible to inspire other people and provide, uh, you know, access and opportunity to others. Um, but, you know, I found early on that you know, I just needed to lean into it and be myself. And, you know, my work speaks for me. And I, you know, certainly have been subject to discrimination and, and you know, made to feel like uh, my voice was not as important as other voices, um, you know, from a biased perspective as to who might, you know, be the authority on a particular topic. But, um, you know, I just, I love my background and I think that it's one of the reasons why I love this work so much. Um, it's because I can um, go through those, those perspectives and understand perspectives um, that differ from mine because I heard them all, all the time just growing up. So that's been my experience. I love that. Thank you for sharing your story. I always enjoy hearing people's stories. Uh, my grandmother actually is a storyteller. Uh, so I grew up listening to stories. And I think that is also a way um, it carries into my work today. Because I love, you know, once you hear an individual's experiences, backgrounds, upbringing, it paints a larger picture as opposed to those characteristics that you were referencing mm -hmm. earlier. Um, and I would say my experience is almost opposite. Uh, so I uh, grew up in a biracial, bipolitical household, um, have that. And my dad was um, adopted into a blonde haired blue eyed family. Um, and the story is that we ac he actually didn't know that he was black until I was born because I have sickle cell trait. And that is typically only found um, in Africa. So, that has always been an interesting story. Um, I think I grew up blissfully unaware. I grew up in Tucson, Arizona, so it was predominantly a Mexican community, very um, kind of a melting pot, if you will. So I never thought anything of it. And then I always knew like, you know, my dad and I and my brother were like the darker ones in the family, but that was cool, you know? Um, and then, as I started to get older and I started to experience different parts of the country, that's when I realized like, oh, you know, I don't always fit in everywhere. And so I actually got, again, going back to my Achilles heel and where I could do better, I got quiet about it. And I learned to, as I say, chameleon under my white privilege so that way I could fit in. So instead of leaning into it, as I got older, um, I actually started to hide from it. Um, and from my ethnicity and, you know, using my voice, I became more observant. Um, I didn't want to make any waves. I've always been outspoken, um, which was interesting because as I got older, I started to become quiet. Um, and that definitely carried into the workplace. You know, I was defining success as fitting in and being able to not stand out. Um, you know, my first corporate job, I was one of two 
black people in the workplace, um, a male and then myself. And I was like, yeah, like, you know, I deserve to be here as if, you know, I didn't think anything of it. I don't, um, it's been interesting to reflect on and it's been difficult. And it's another reason why I lean into those tough conversations because it's perspectives like yours, Jackie, that I love hearing that gives me, you know, confidence and it gives me the ability to get outside my own head um, and my own worldview. So that's been my experience thus far, but it is ever changing. <laughs> So Jenna, I want, to, I want to go back to something you said. You said that going through your journey, especially when you entered into the workplace, you, just, you decided to be quiet. Could you talk a little bit about why that was and what caused you to transform so that you felt like you needed to speak up more? Yeah, so I've always been an observant person. I think when you grow up in a family where you have black, white, Republican, Democrat, you kind of learn just to like open your ears a little bit more before you speak. So I've always been observant. And I think that the theme was kind of like, you know, sit down, be quiet, do your work. So that's what I picked up on in the workplace. You know, if you could prove your worth by putting your head down and working hard, that will get you a lot farther um, than anything else. I've obviously realized that's not the case, um, that people are privileged and that, you know, no matter how hard you work or who you know, uh, it won't get you the same abilities and opportunities as others. I actually just did a workplace training, what was it, Tuesday? So two days ago. And there was a question that asked, it was basically just surveying, you know, asking to survey your workplace. And once you put in your answers, it would show you where you answered, where your organization answered, and then what the, uh, across the globe, what those answers were. So it'd start to give you, you know, population samples. And one of the question was, uh, I've never felt like I don't fit into my workplace. And, you know, there was a range of sometimes, or never, sometimes, always. Um, and I put sometimes, you know, I sometimes don't feel like I fit in. And when I hit submit and I saw the results, most of the time it was people never felt like they didn't fit in. So that told, you know, that tells you a story about the workplace. And that tells you that the workplace is designed for certain individuals. Because if no one ever feels like they're, you know, not, if no one ever feels like they don't fit in, what are, who are the people on the other side of that spectrum? You know, who, who isn't fitting in and why not? Um, so because of that, I think that data point even recently kind of affirms how I've observed the workplace and why I've decided or why, I, you know, back then was, was quiet about it because I didn't want to make waves. <laughs> right. And so, you know, Jackie, as, we, if we, as we've been dialoguing with different organizations, so whose responsibility is that to, to resolve that particular challenge where you've got this group of underrepresented folks that don't feel like they necessarily belong, but they, they represent a small percentage of what's going on. And so whose responsibility is it to fix that? Is it the, the folks who are underrepresented raising their hands and being more uh, vocal about what's going on to call the organization to the carpet? Or is it the organization's responsibility to Kind of cater to uh, that under, underrepresented group. How do, how how should organizations and individuals think about that? Yeah, uh, you know, one of the things that I've heard a lot is that people who uh, are culturally diverse or uh, ability diverse or represent uh, any type of diversity, they get exhausted with having to defend themselves all the time. So really, it's the responsibility of the entire organization. So, you know, some people put it on, you know, it's HR's responsibility or it's the manager's responsibility. It's every single person's responsibility in the organization to call out when people are not using inclusive language, when people are showing bias in the workplace. Um, it's not, you know, just on, you know, the culturally diverse person or HR, it's everyone's responsibility. And that's how to create the kind of environment and the kind of culture that you want in an organization. It's when everyone, um, you know, lives by the same set of rules and that those rules are 
people are important and you want them to feel valued and honored and respected for who they are, the journey that they're on. And again, it's everybody's responsibility. Got it. I will so, add one, one note please. to that if I can, is that I do, I a hundred percent agree. I think you have to walk the walk. You know, you can't put it on your careers page that you're inclusive and you're diverse if you're not. Um, and you can't, you know, provide that as your employer brand or your culture. I also think that power dynamics can sometimes stifle that in the workplace. So while everybody needs to be held accountable and walk the walk, I do think it starts at the leadership position because if they're going to call it out and they're going to hold people accountable, it will trickle down um, as opposed to if you know, they're quiet too, and leadership is not calling out these microaggressions um, and these injustices. People who are afraid for their job or they want to make sure they have a paycheck um, will not go against the grain. So I do think um, everybody needs to walk the walk and the spark starts at the leadership level. That's right, Jenna. Right. That, that's very important because that power dynamic does is one of the reasons that folks are quiet because of the risk of saying the wrong thing and not having a job at the end of uh, what you have to say. And so there's definitely fear about that. Uh, so I want to pose this to the, the audience. And so if you have questions that you want uh, both Jackie and Jenna to respond to, use the Q&A feature uh about a situation you might be having right now or questions that you have in terms of how to have dialogue with somebody uh but i'll, I'll kick that question off with this if someone wanted to approach you about getting to know you better because a lot of people will say things uh that are well-meaning but don't come off well like so tell me a little bit about where you're from yeah. Um, these things that could feel like microaggressions. And so how, how would you give someone advice about the right way to, to learn more about you and what you be, would be willing to share and how, how you would be receptive to that kind of uh, discussion if somebody wanted to get to know you that way? I actually heard this answer on a podcast. Uh, the other day. So Kurt, as you had mentioned, you know, we're always learning in this and I'm always trying to listen to different viewpoints and understand what works for other people. And I actually really liked this idea. Um, instead of just point blank, you know, where are you from? Or tell me more about yourself. Uh, pay attention and invest in them as a person. So, hey, Jackie, I heard you mention the six attributes of inclusive language on the webinar the other day. I would love to, you know, pull you aside for a one on one chat. You have 15 minutes next week. Mm -hmm. um, so paying attention to whether it's what, you know, whatever they're saying in a Zoom meeting or an internal meeting, um, if they responded to an email really well, picking up on the work they're doing so that way you're investing in them as a person and they can also reciprocate that to you. So, um, you know, making sure that you're one, picking up on work that they've done or something that they've said, asking them to meet or explaining further and that'll open the door. The thing that I would add, and, and I certainly echo Jenna's statements on that, is that share something about yourself. If you're willing to be open and be vulnerable uh, about your own background and experiences, um, that encourages other people to, to be the same. So, you know, make it conversational. Don't, uh, you know, make it as, you know, let me ask you this series of 10 <laughs> questions. Um, you know, that's not something that, you know, a conversation that where people feel um, excited and, and want to be open. But if you share things about yourself, then you can create a, a two-way dialogue where I think you can get a lot more um, out of a conversation and, and create those opportunities to connect with other people. Got it. So as we start thinking about um, ways to engage in conversations, within the workplace based on what we've talked about before. Um, if you had to give some, and you've given the six uh, rules already, Jackie, but what are some of the other things that you would give to somebody who's kind of on the fence right now? So they've, they've gone through this progression where they understand more about uh, the Black Lives Matter movement. Mm -hmm. uh, they might be reading a series of articles or blogs, but they're hesitant to, to move forward to the next step. What, what advice would you give to them to get over that hurdle of still being silent, but being well-meaning and they, they want to do something? What would you tell them? 
Yeah, that's a good question, Kurt. You know, I think that, um, you know, as a society, I think we're stepping into that, you know, stepping into being more vocal. I think we have in the past shied away as a whole, especially in corporate America, from commenting on, you know, political things or social, you know, societal things. Um, but people are leaning in more on, you know, making those statements. Um, and, I, and I think people just have to, you know, step out there and, and in a, in a small way, um, you know, there are some, some things that you can do and, and questions that you can ask that, you know, give yourself an opportunity to stand in the gap for people. But I think just, you, you have to just um, step out there. And um, one of the things that uh, I'm doing is, is authoring a, a white paper on inclusive language um, that will give you, you know, little tips and things that you can um, change in your own language and call out for other people. So, um, you know, there's kind of a, a grid there with things that are, you know, a lot of people say, you know, that are part of language that you hear a lot, why those terms are, are wrong, and then what you can say um, that's better uh, to get your, your, your point across and your thoughts across. Um, but it's important that we start with ourselves and, and take those small steps forward. Yeah, so we just had an interesting um, question pop up in the chat. It's addressed to both of you guys. Um, so I'd love for you both to take turns answering it. Um, but it asks, can you um, both speak to the process of establishing a shared vernacular around inclusive language in an organization that doesn't necessarily have the financial resources to invest in professional guiding, um, a professional guiding them through this process? Is it wise to begin this work without investing in external qualified resources? Do you want to start and then I'll um, so you know I just mentioned the white paper um, and I think education um, there's a lot of reading that that you can do and you know find resources and people that are qualified that you trust that have been vetted um, there's a lot of information that's available um, for free um, on the diversity movement for example has uh, an insights page that has a lot of, you know, blogs and um, podcasts and white papers and, and ebooks even um, where you can start to get that information. Um, but find people um, that want to talk to you about it. And I know that everyone that I know in, in this work is willing to have a conversation to get you started on your path. Yeah, I was going to say something similar. Uh, I don't know if I can probably read part of the question, but uh, I think if you're able to establish allies in your own workplace, so for example, hey, I'm reading this paper or this article or this book, would you wanna you know, have lunch with me for 30 minutes so we can talk about it? Uh, someone internally in your workplace, so you can start to find your own allies. Um, and then you know, if the workplace is accepting of this, you can you know, scale it out. Um, at a larger at a larger capacity to invite others into the workplace so that way you don't need to financially invest in a professional to facilitate those tough conversations and trainings um, but you can more so have like a grassroots movement internally that's great and then just a, a couple more questions for both of you about you know specific scenarios that people are experiencing in the workplace um, Jackie this one might be more up your alley but how do you intervene if you observe a person not using inclusive language mm. Thanks, Kayla. Um, you, you have to just call it out and you can call it out in a very nice way by pulling someone aside and say, hey, you said this, you know, is that what you meant? Like, and then explain that that term or phrase um, can be offensive. You know, I've certainly done that multiple times. And very often what I find is that people don't realize that what they're saying can be offensive and they appreciate learning. Um, and, and then take time to have a conversation with them and, and answer questions about it. Um, but I find a lot of times people don't realize that we're, what they're saying can be offensive. So pulling them aside and, and having a gentle conversation with them, I think, has been my approach. That's great. Um, thanks, Jackie. And, and Jenna, uh, this one's a little more geared towards you, but how, um, how can you facilitate civil communications if you're an HR professional? 
Great question. So I actually facilitate civil dialogue, um, which is a format of civil communication in order to have difficult conversations. I also think there's no harm in you, uh, you know, proclaiming yourself as a facilitator as well. Sometimes it helps to have a third party involved, um, specifically from an HR perspective. I know that there are sticky situations that are brought to your attention. Um, depending on the, every incident is, is, is unique. Uh, so if you are able to get everyone in a room and have those conversations, a lot of times it seems very uncomfortable and it's not your go-to, but a lot of times it just helps giving, you know, the humanity aspect of it, you know, um, everybody in a room understanding their shared experience, their different perspectives, sometimes that helps, but, you know, always one off situations to try and understand the history, the background, um, and then kind of, you know, doing your work to facilitate that yourself. Again, using the, you know, what was your experience instead of you did this. Uh, a lot of times we have to de escalate. Uh, by bringing it on to yourself, even as an HR professional, it might seem weird because you weren't at the incident. But in my experience, what I've learned about this incident is X, Y, and Z. Uh, so there are some ways that you can, again, de-escalate and it won't seem as uh, forceful when you're communicating. Thanks, Jenna. Yeah. So I want to pose this question to, to both Jackie and Jenna. This is, we're about 10 minutes from the end of the our time together. What are some parting thoughts that you want to share uh, as, as we're thinking about this topic? So if we were to put a bow on the conversation, what would you uh, want to share with the group, Jackie? Hmm. You know, I understand that, that people are what matters and that's in your communities, in your workplace, as you, you know, are going through your work day and, and understanding what your priorities are, people should be a priority. And that's in everything around how you speak to people, um, you know, how you create your, your policies and procedures for people. Um, but start with people and, you know, understand that you're going to get your best from people when you're able to make them feel comfortable and make them feel that they can be their full selves at work and their, you know, their, their best selves. Um, that's when you get the innovation, the creativity, the productivity that companies are so often looking for. But if you make that, you know, priority as people, you'll, you'll get some of those business results that you're looking for. Jenna, I, Could, I know you're sorry, doing I was gonna a, say, couldn't a, have said it better myself. <laughs> <laughs> so I wanted to give you this opportunity to talk a little bit about uh, what's what's ahead for you. What are what are some of the, your plans and as, as you're doing this work and you know how how are you seeing things? Uh, if you could react to some of the things that are going on in the country right now and 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 how your work is uh, going to help to impact and affect that. Yeah, I mean. 2020 is a year for creation. I think it's a year for a lot of stress um, and a lot of stress management, but it's also given me an opportunity to create and to lean into civil communication in the outside world because we're seeing, you know, this pandemic, the civil rights movement, we're seeing it bleed into the workplace. So being able to create content to help people have those civil conversations and to implement civil dialogue in the workplace. Um, so whether that's, you know, through blogs, whether I'm actually working on a workshop right now where I can work one on one with people just to improve their own personal communication skills, because we're not in the workplace right now. It, it, a lot of the responsibility does fall on those individuals, um, as opposed to the, the manager, because everyone's sitting behind their computer on a Zoom screen. Um, so a lot of creation um, and then working one on one to help people uh, communicate productively over Zoom. <laughs> right. So Zoom is the new workplace. Uh, <laughs> yeah. That is the it uh, is. This is summary of the moment. Uh, I just want to thank both of you uh, for spending time with us today to, to take us through the discussion, uh, to echo what Jackie just mentioned. Uh, an inclusive language white paper is, is forthcoming. So we'll, the diversity movement is going to author that and that will be out uh, by the, the beginning of August. And uh, I just want to thank everyone who participated with us today uh, to spend a little time helping us uh, go through this, this notion of inclusive language. 
it's really important that as we're working in teams, the thing that we is the most important and unlocks innovation is making sure that all the voices at the table are heard and actually have an opportunity to participate in the decision making process. And so uh, with that in mind, we have resources on the diversitymovement.com that you can take advantage of. Uh, this recording is going to be made available to you uh, via email and for uh, friends that you may know that haven't had an opportunity to take advantage of this, uh, we're going to post this on the website as well. So Jackie, Jenna, thank you so much for spending some time with us uh, this afternoon and uh, thank you to everyone else who attended uh, this afternoon and spent a little time with us enjoying uh, your lunch hour. So thanks again and we'll be in touch soon with uh, the next thing. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. -bye.